This program is brought to you by Emory University. Our next speaker is here. His name is Dr. Thomas Price, and he works here at Emory, and I'm going to read this here, Chief of Medicine for the Wesley Woods Geriatric Hospital. He's also the director of the Emory University Center for Health and Aging's Elder Abuse Task Force. I wanted to make sure that I, I read that correctly, but more importantly, I know Dr. Price um, for being a very, very dedicated advocate um, helping us in DeKalb County with our uh, multi-departmental task force, actually coming to meetings um, in the DA's office every month to sit there and talk about what are the physical issues in some of these exploitation cases, dedicating so much time to this issue, um, and that dedication is something we really appreciate. I know that he's going to have a lot to say uh, to give us some of a background of the physical issues that some of our elder exploitation victims um, that they suffer from and, and what is behind uh, those physical issues. So I'd like to invite Dr. Tom Price to the podium. What I want to talk to you all today at this point is talk to you about what is it about aging that causes people to be more likely to become a victim. And we see this with children, and we kind of innately understand with children, well, they're, they're young, they're naive, they trust, the, they trust adults implicitly, and they're extremely vulnerable because of that manipulation of trust. Well, the same issue happens with the elderly, and we've just discussed about financial exploitation, how someone in a position of trust can through malicious intent basically ruin an older person's ability to not only have money but be able to use that money for health needs and needs for care and function. First we'll start with what is the normal aging process and this is a question a lot of people have. Now we've seen in the last 50 years a massive increase in life expectancy. Now the top number, the 90 year olds, are people who reach the age of 85, there hasn't been much change in the last 20 years. If you live to 85, the best medical technology can do is get you maybe to 91, 92 on average. So we don't see a massive increase in the top number of life expectancy. However, from birth or age 65, we continue to see an increase. What this means is that as the baby boomer generation enters into the um, the era great, that they're being over the age of 65, thus the Medicare a, uh, age that they're going to achieve, they're going to stay longer in that age group. They're going to stay longer, live longer. They're more likely to live to 85 years old. There are 10,000 new Medicare enrollees per day now that the baby boomers have started to come into the system. And this is a major reason why you see one of the issues in the election that's coming up is the fact is how do we sustain Medicare when we have 10,000 people signing up per day. One of the main issues we look at is what is the quality at which someone is aging. We've all seen 85 or 90 year old people who are pretty robust, walking every day, getting their own groceries, you know, we had, a couple years ago, we had that um, older gentleman with the tree scam that someone cut down his tree against his will, and he was sharp enough to call the bank, tell him I wrote a check, these guys tried to rip me off, and the police arrested them. But then there's people who are younger than that who couldn't even tell you who had knocked on their door that morning. So we, separated them, we separate them usually as geriatricians into frail or robust. We're seeing as medical technology improves and hopefully as geriatrics becomes more prevalent, we see a reduction in the disease burden or the impact of disease on people's ability to live their lives. This means that people are living longer with a lower, as a result of a lower disease burden. However, they will have that disease for a longer period of time. So their dementia may be better cared for, but they still have dementia. To kind of explain how this works, it's kind of confusing, but I use this accumulated injury model. And basically, you see the box that says A and the box that says G. Well, A is basically when you're born. You have had no diseases, you have had no um, negative impacts, no trauma, no injury to yourself. 
on most of the times when you're born. But every time you get a disease, which is the gray box you see in B, well, the body has to heal from that. And because organic systems are not perfect, your healing is never 100% recovery. You always have some small deficit remaining. That's the little black box in C. And as life goes on and you continue to get injuries, trauma, uh, diseases like pneumonia, et cetera, little scars are left behind. And essentially, we can think of aging as the accumulation of those residual effects of previous disease or injury. So the more disease, the more injury someone suffers, the more burden they have of those little black boxes, essentially that scarring. And they're more likely to be frail as they get older rather than to be more robust. Someone who has less of those insults are going to have more clean space within that big, um, that big square. And as a result, they're going to be more functional. So this is one of the thought models we can use for what a basic idea of aging actually is. So again, aging is essentially, in, one is temporal definition of basically living on Earth long enough. The other is this biological definition which says accumulation of injury results in a biological age rather than a, a chronological age. So then people ask me, what is normal aging? Because most of the people that come to my clinic the family members are bringing them in saying, mom's getting forgetful, or mom's doing this, or mom's doing that. Is this normal or is this not? So some things are normal with aging. There's a change in taste perception. There's a decreased ability to sense thirst. There's a decreased ability to upregulate the heart rate and the challenge to a stress. But there are things that are not normal aging, that people often attribute to normal aging. Senility, we used to call it. But that could actually be dementia. Urinary incontinence, losing the ability to control one's bladder, is not an inevitable consequence of aging. It is an actual disease process. It can be fixed. And we have people come to me and they say, well, I'm getting old, I'm going to leak. And I'm like, no, you're not going to leak necessarily. You have a condition, we treat it. It's not something you have to accept as part of aging. Cataracts. People accumulate cataracts when they're older, but we, they don't have to live with it. We can fix them. So getting people to understand that there's some things that happen more, have a higher probability of occurring as you get older, but aren't necessarily part of a normal aging process. So some people ask me, what is geriatrics then? Because that's what we're talking about here is geriatric science. Well, there's two types of sciences in, the, in aging. One is gerontology. This is the social science of aging. So I'm a gerontologist when I'm looking at um, the epidemiology of a disease or a condition when I'm looking at the social interaction of an environment to a patient. But I'm a geriatrician when I'm treating a patient with medication or doing diagnostic workup, etc. That is the field of medicine that is devoted. So one is a social science, one is a medical science. And a lot of people trained at Emory, for example, are both trained in gerontology and geriatrics. The ability to understand the social impact of people as they age as well as the medical biological impact of aging. The biggest condition that we deal with when we talk about financial exploitation or risk factors involving physical abuse or neglect is cognitive impairment. The two major types are dementia and depression. And people say, well, does depression really affect cognition? And my answer to them is yes. In fact, a lot of people come to me presenting with a complaint of memory loss turn out that they have, they have depression and not dementia. And the treatment of their depression results in an improvement of their cognitive function. Depression can also be a prodrome or beginning part of a full-blown dementia process, or it can be the result of a dementia process occurring. Some people start to realize they're losing their memory, they're losing their ability to function, and as a result develop a reactive depression. As far as cognitive impairment is concerned, the, the statistics back in 2008 showed that 35% of older persons over the age of 70 have some form of mild cognitive impairment, dementia, or other changes in executive cognitive function. The definitions that lie between normal memory and dementia change all the time. Mix, uh, mixed cognitive disorder, not dementia. Cognitive disorder, not dementia. Uh, mild cognitive impairment, 
cognitive disorder not otherwise specified. All these terms are basically the same thing for you're showing some evidence of memory loss, They're, it's not related to aging, it's abnormal, but we're not sure if it means a dementia or not. The difference between the other conditions and dementia is function. We cannot say someone has a dementia until we see that it impacts their ability to function on a daily basis. Now for those of us who are in the field, call this the activities of daily living or independent activities of daily living. I mean instrumental activities of daily living. The IADLs, the latter, are basically writing checks, managing your finances, shopping, taking your medications, doing your laundry, preparing meals, etc. The activities of daily living or the ADLs are more basic. Bathing, hygiene, dressing, being able to transfer from bed to another situation like in a wheelchair or standing upright, etc. When someone develops a dementia, they, in order to have a definition that meets that, to order to have, uh, meet the definition of that, they basically have to have some type of an impairment identified. Once they have an impairment identified, then what ends up happening is that now they're going to need assistance. And most relevant to this group here, the first, almost always, the first impairment is managing finances. That's almost always, inevitably, the first most sensitive indicator of what happens at the beginning of a dementia. So before mom's getting lost or starting to act funny in the evening or wandering around the neighborhood, she's going to lose her ability to manage her finances. So one of the first questions I ask in pretty much every interview is, who's managing your finances? Are you? Is someone else? And often there'll be an argument between the daughter and the, and the mother or the, the, the children and the father because They'll say, I'm doing fine, the patient will, and then the family will say, no, they're not. They've double paid bills, they've missed other bills, um, they've had their power shut off, they've had their water shut off at times, because they're forgetting. And this is not something that had happened previously. So we also want to find out about the duration. If someone has just had memory impairment over the last month, and they had been in the hospital at the beginning of that month, I'm going to be thinking other processes other than Alzheimer's disease. In fact, I can't even make a diagnosis of dementia until I've seen some time between a hospital or acute illness and the ability to properly assess someone's cognition. Some people have personality disorders. So some people mess up their checkbook, but they've always messed it up, even since they were 30. Okay, so that's fine. That is not going to necessarily point to that they're developing dementia. It's hard when one spouse manages the finances and the other spouse never did, and that spouse that managed the finances dies or gets hospitalized. And then we see things evolve with the remaining spouse not being able to manage the finances. And the question is, is it that because they've never done it and they're just not sure how? Or is it because they have some type of an underlying problem? The, um, Impairment of short-term memory is another very sensitive indicator. That's the most common complaint I get that usually leads to a diagnosis of dementia. And you're going to see this during your interviews when you talk to someone and they ask you to repeat your questions over again. I want you to differentiate that from the, ability not, the, the inability to pay attention to the questions you're asking. You have to wait a long time for a response. That's a delirium that's different than a dementia in the fact that it's usually related to some recent change, whether it's an infection, et cetera. And these people with treatment of the underlying cause of delirium will recover and then you would do an assessment to find out do they have any permanent injury. So normal things that people come to me and say, oh, my memory's bad because I can't remember someone's name. I said, well, can you remember it that night? You know, you do wake up and like say, oh, darn, I didn't remember John's name, but now I do. That's normal. In fact, all of us even have it at, at our ages now. Forgetting where you put things or forgetting why you went into a room. What did I come into the kitchen for? I forgot. Well, we get distracted. We're storing these things in a, in a very unstable medium in our brain and they, they can die, the memory can die very quickly and you can feel like you're lost, but that is a normal thing. Now if someone continue, consciously, well, consistently all throughout the day is having that problem, that becomes more of an issue. Missing words in normal conversation. 
my wife does this all the time. She tells me to put the thing in the thing. And I'm like, I'm getting to the point where I know exactly what she's talking about, which is weird. But the reality is, even at young ages, we often will forget names, but we will remember them later. And that's the key, is remembering something later. Like if she can never tell me the word kitchen ever again, if that word is gone, then there's pathology, because that means that a, a nerve cell is damaged, that a memory is lost, the memory of that word. And then we have to figure out what that is, and that's usually involved with a stroke or some type of other form of dementia. These are things that you see that are warning signs that do not point to normal memory loss due to aging. If you hear about these in your interview, if your f the family's telling you what's going on, these are significant, these are basically pointing to the possibility of a dementia. Behavioral changes, becoming more confused, agitated, paranoid. A lot of us go out to a, a situation and the, f the, the, the older person is saying someone's stealing from them. They stole this, they stole that. Well, they may never have had this or that. They may never have had it. They may not have a Buick in the, in the, in, in the driveway. It may have been sold 20 years ago. But they go, because of the dementia, they go out there and they don't see it and they flip out and they think that the daughter stole it from them. It's a tough decision to figure out, well, is this real? Was there a theft involved? And is this, par is this not paranoia or is it? And that's when you may want to get more involved in memory testing and probably have a professional see them. Loss of short-term memory we talked about. Frequently getting lost. Lost while driving or lost while just walking around the neighborhood. Um, in the, where I worked in, I initially started working at the Miami VA when I was in training. And the Miami VA, we had patients who would get lost in the VA itself. If anyone's been to the Miami VA, it's bigger than the Atlanta one. It's a huge maze. And it's not uncommon to find nursing home patients in the, old, uh, the older times, before we had the security locks and everything, wandering the halls and getting stuck in corners because they couldn't figure out how to get back to where they were. And so we basically had to lock the entire nursing home unit down, and this was done in the 90s. The uh, inability to recognize people that you should see every day, forgetting your daughter's name and not being able to remember it, or saying that your daughter's not your daughter and accusing them of someone else, being someone else. And decline in functional independence we talked about. Dementia is a very, uh, is a very sensitive topic when you're talking directly to older people because everyone has the fear that it will come. Everyone is afraid of dementia for the primary reason that dementias are often untreatable. We do not have medical technology to cure Alzheimer's disease at this time. And so people will be told that essentially it's like, the, it's like it was 10 years ago with cancer. If you have cancer, you basically started writing your last will and testament at that point. You were done. But these days, people live decades with cancer. Types of dementia, there is more than Alzheimer's disease, and this surprises some people. But we also have types of vascular dementia. There's either focused dementia, which we call multi-infarct, or there's the global, more global ischemic vascular dementia. We have Lewy body dementia, which looks like Parkinson's disease and is more likely to cause paranoia and hallucinations. Frontotemporal dementias, which cause severe behavioral changes, may cause violent actions, striking out at family members. Alzheimer's disease, mostly an amnestic disorder, loss of memory that worsens over time. And then we have, of course, the mild cognitive impairment, which is in that gray zone of possible, possibly being an early Alzheimer's disease or just being a condition in itself. Talked about some of these symptoms before. Um, the diagnosis of dementia is done in a number of ways. Most commonly, it's a clinical diagnosis. It means a physician needs to document and diagnose it. So you can't label someone with dementia unless there actually has been some type of a medical professional evaluating them and determining that. Now, this, not, don't, this doesn't just include physicians. This also can include PhDs in psychology. And often, I will make a diagnosis in conjunction with a psychologist's evaluation called a neuropsych assessment. And a neuropsychiatric assessment can take two hours or longer, involves a number of puzzles, tests for drawing trails, tracing mazes, being able to recognize faces, naming objects in a series, doing calculation, et cetera. It takes about two hours plus to do a full assessment. Then that comes back to me, shows the pattern of memory problems, and I can figure out which of the diagnoses of dementia it most likely fits with. Neuroimaging is becoming more, more pervasive. It is extremely expensive and limited to certain areas. So like at Emory, we do do Parkinson's disease imaging. We are testing um, on a research basis 
imaging for Alzheimer's disease, but it's not available clinically. Genetic markers at well, we only use those usually in cases where we have a strong family inheritance pattern and we may want to screen the rest of the family. It's kind of controversial. We have this test, but a lot of people have said because we don't have a cure, giving people the information that they have a genetic, they have a genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's disease is basically patting them on the back and saying, well, there, but there will be nothing we can do for you right now. So a lot of people have been kind of resistant to continue to pervasively using genetic testing. In the uh, 19th century, the diagnosis was done visually. So these are actually medical, this is actually from a medical textbook from the Liber National Library of Medicine. They actually show these were paintings that were done so physicians could recognize what patients with dementia look like. And I saw a man with a ski cap on the other day in my clinic. But this is, this is, um, this is what we, I would call age, ageist profiling, if you will, by looking at, the, looking at the physical characteristics. So we've come a long way since then. The most sensitive test I use for just a basic idea is, is something going on, and you can all do this yourself, is ask them to draw a clock. Ask them to draw all 12 numbers on the clock, and ask them to draw the hands at usually a time. 10 minutes after 10 is usually the, the common one. This one is 10 minutes after 11 for this series. The normal one you see on, on the uh, left. And you see all numbers are correct. The 12, the 3, the 6, and 9 are at the, four, at the four directions, the north, south, east, and west. And you see the hands are correctly drawn. And even better is that the hour hand is small and the minute hand is long. That's perfect. Early Alzheimer's disease, notice where the 6 is. And notice where the 3 and the 9 are. They're not at the cardinal points. They're kind of skewed. And you'll see as the Alzheimer's disease goes on, you see that that skewing continues. Well, eventually, you see no relation of the numbers at all. So those numbers aren't even in sequence. They're actually done the opposite way. Notice the hands drop off when you get to moderate disease. They can't follow that second part of the command. Draw a clock with all 12 numbers and the hands at 10 minutes after 10 or 11. Three steps. They fail the third step. We also do that with a paper folding exercise. Take this paper from my hand, fold it once, and then fold it a second time. And they usually fold it once, fold it twice, fold it three times, fold it four times, fold it five times, and don't, they don't stop until they can't fold it anymore. The failure to recognize the, the terminal command. So you can do this with people. It takes about maybe four minutes to do if, if you're really patient. The average for me is 30 seconds. I tie this into asking them to remember three words, giving them a five minute span where I ask them to do the clock draw test. And then after they've done that, it has, it has acted as a distractor. Then I ask them, okay, what were those three words I told you? Those two tests together are actually scientifically validated as a test called the mini cog or mini, a miniaturized cognitive assessment. And it actually has anywhere from 70 to 80% um, specificity to a dementia. Mild cognitive impairment and financial exploitation. So we, talk about, we talked earlier about financial exploitation. When people have the mild, even the mild cognitive impairment phase of memory impairment, they still are four times more likely to make financial decision errors or any decision error. We also see damage to the prefrontal cortex, especially in um, Alzheimer's disease, multi-infarct dementia, ischemic uh, vascular dementia, and even frontotemporal. We see one of the earlier signs being inhibition of um, the loss of inhibition of risk taking. Grandmother, my grandmother would never gamble, and all of a sudden she starts to gamble. She's buying lottery tickets five or six times a day. Why is she buying lottery tickets five or six times a day? She never did this before. You know, that's a basic example. But what we see more is change in the investment strategy. Financially, they may have been pretty much conservative by putting money in only in CDs, putting money only in the bank account, and collecting 0.2% or whatever. Now, all of a sudden, you see them buying high-risk stocks, property in Bolivia, things like that. And you're like, what the heck is this? This is not the same pattern. And that actually happens. And scam artists know that. And they take advantage of that. That's why they prey on these people, because of that basic biological fact is that they don't have the ability to override their risk taking. Nearly two thirds of all patients suffering from elder abuse have dementia. Very strong association with some type of elder mistreatment. 
unfortunately, screening modalities for elder abuse. There have been 10 different screening modalities proposed. None of them have sensitivity in demented patients because you have to ask questions. Up until the last two years, almost all the research we have in, all, in, in, in elder mistreatment scientifically is reliant on one tool, surveys. You cannot survey a person with dementia. Why our research that we do at Emory is actually focused on evidence. We actually take court cases and look at court cases of elder mistreatment because that's more objective data rather than subjectively asking someone if they feel they've been a victim of abuse. This is, um, you saw Laura Muscada in one of the clips earlier. She was the, the, the physician in the nice white lab coat that they used who was photogenic. And she, she actually worked on this um, in, um, at UCI, uh, University of California, Irvine. And this is very similar to basically any type of, uh, this is very similar to the child abuse, psychological, um, uh, sorry, physical, psychological, or financial abuse. The um, pr prior models used to say, well, maybe we turn caregivers into abusers through constant stress. And a lot of people looked at this but found that there really was no correlation. That the person who commits a mistreatment has a history in the past of some type of an antisocial behavior. They've either been the victim of abuse themselves or have criminal activity, substance abuse history, mental illness history. They are not made from scratch. They have been cultivated. And when put in this situation where they realize that now they're in a position of power over someone else, they have someone dependent on them, that means they have more ability to ch change things according to what they feel is correct. And they feel, well, I'm, since I'm taking care of mom, I'm entitled to her savings. I'm entitled to spend that money. And they convince themselves that they're going to do it in the best interests of mom. But often that's not the case. Depression is another thing. Depression basically means someone's, the major issue I see with depression is someone has lost attention to daily details. When you're in a severe depression, you're not taking care of your basic hygiene correctly. You're not managing your finances promptly. You start to become more passive in your life. And so if someone's in a position where they can take advantage of that, they will. So we talk about um, the findings that we see that depressed older adults are more likely to be the victims of mistreatment. And the question has been, is this causative or associative? For example, if someone is an older person and they're being mistreated, do they become depressed because of the mistreatment? Or do, do, are they depressed first and that makes them vulnerable to mistreatment? And that still hasn't been worked out. But it's the same thing as the question of dementia and depression. Is dementia uh, is depression a pre-existing condition that leads to dementia? Or when patients get dementia, does it result in them becoming depressed? Depression, as well as dementia, are underdiagnosed. They're not recognized until the disease becomes so profound that their ability to function is readily obvious to anyone. So they often don't get brought to the attention of people. And depression can cause same degrees of functional impairment. I've admitted people to the psychiatry unit at Wesley Woods and taking care of them there because they cannot take care of themselves because their depression is so profound. And once we treat them, they start to reintegrate back into society. But it's very complex. And in that period of time where they're functionally impaired, they have become severely vulnerable to family members, to community members, et cetera, who want to take advantage of them. Some associated conditions with depression are listed above. I don't want you to get into the difference between what's bipolar disorder, what's an adjustment disorder, et cetera. There's different complexities to de depression. There are some that have violent components. So we have depression with psychosis or bipolar disorder with mania. They become very violent people. Mania and bipolar disorder is very important because it increases the likelihood to want to spend money. So all they need is an outlet. You hear the characteristic of someone going to the Rolls Royce dealership and trying to buy a car. I mean, they, they basically are living on Social Security and they're trying to get a $200,000 automobile. And um, the other thing is you see basically these people, they are just looking for an outlet because they have lost the ability to gain any sense of satisfaction from the little things in life, essentially, from friendship, from going out and doing things with people, that they can only, f the only thing they can think of is buy, 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 because I'm getting something out of that. It's physical, it, it's there, it reminds me 
that I've done something, but they can't feel anything else. These are treatable. They're pathologic conditions of the brain. So we talk about pitfalls. I like this slide. If anyone remembers this, I'll give you brownie points, but depression and dementia often coexist. We talked about the lead-in. We talked about even that sometimes they can be confused with each other. But we also see things that can occur in dementia and depression as part of the natural disease could also potentially indicate some type of abuse. Symptoms we look at for neglect and abuse, weight loss, functional decline, instability of behavior and nursing home use, or even hospitalizations, emergency, home, emergency room use. It's just a hypothetical because there's two schools of thought whether patients who are being abused are less likely to use healthcare resources because the family wants to hide them intentionally or they're more likely to use them because they end up getting sick and then the family members don't want to take care of them. In Miami, we used to have the problem called the grandpa dump. Every day before a three-day holiday, a three-day weekend, we would have 10 or 15 older people dropped off at the emergency room with very vague complaints because the family wants to go away for the weekend. And I would often threaten them. I said, if you leave your grandfather here, he has nothing wrong with him medically, we're going to charge you with abandonment. We've actually had people drop someone off the ER and then leave, not even telling anyone. So there's been a lot of crackdown on that. So people don't do that as much. We have a lot more security presence in our emergency rooms than we used to. But back in the 90s, this was still common practice. So let's go into how this all relates to vulnerability. This is a definition from about 10 years ago, and it says an older adult is considered vulnerable if he or she demonstrates characteristics or performs behaviors that are associated with subsequent morbidity, disability, or death. That means their behavior or their actions have become incongruent with persistence of life at a quality level. So we talked about risk-taking behavior. If someone only has $10,000 in the bank and they need that money to pay for medications, their house, etc., and they go and they blow it all on lottery tickets, they buy 10,000 lottery tickets. That's they're definitely demonstrating their vulnerability. The question is, why are they vulnerable? Some things we see in the medical history that point to a red flag of being newly vulnerable. The, we talked about the decline in ADL and IADLs. We also see some interesting interplays between the person who brings the patient into the clinic. We see a overly protective domineering. In um, dementia patients, it's not uncommon to see them defer every question I ask them to their caregiver, usually their daughter or their son. And uh, you have to be very careful when that starts happening. Now, is the inner play between this child and the parent free? Uh, does it look um, respectful? Um, there may be a little argument in there, but the argument is equal on both sides as far as emotional input. Those are balanced. I'm OK with those. Someone continually tells their mother to shut up or you don't know what you're talking about, I'm going to get much more worried because that's definitely not a balanced interplay. There should, you may also see a decline in hygiene or weight. When we talk about someone who's lost about 15 pounds in the last three months, we're like, well, did they lose it because there's a disease process, like lung disease, uh, diabetes, something causing that weight loss, cancer? Or do we not have an explanation? We do not have a medical explanation for that weight loss. Is there a social explanation? Has there been a loss of finance, the ability to buy food? Has there been a loss of functional status? Can they go out and get their food? Or are they being intentionally removed from sustenance? We have different types of neglect. We have a passive neglect and we have active neglect. Passive neglect is the family just doesn't buy any foods for them. Active is they refuse to when told to do so. This is an adult protective services more issue. Your mom needs to have food in the house to eat. She can't go out and go to McDonald's like you are. And so what ends up happening is the family member may say, OK, I'll get her food. And you come back in a week later, and you see still no food in the fridge. You've got a problem. Family member just flat out refuses. No, she doesn't need anything. She's fine. She doesn't want to eat anything, et cetera. And we've got a problem. When we talk about those loss of functions, we're basically identifying vulnerability and when someone becomes vulnerable then it ties into what we just talked about in the financial exploitation section they are subject now to potentially undue influence 
So there are a lot of red flags in medical histories. Like one of the most common things I deal with are injuries. This is um, this was actually in uh, Europe, I believe, um, uh, but this could have probably happened on peach tree as well. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, have worked around Grady and seen people with their tricked out little electric scooters going into traffic when they don't even have the yellow triangle on the back of them, but you can get into it. It's undue influence. The formal definition of undue influence by the American Psychological Association is when exploiters, whether family, acquaintances, or strangers, use their power to deceptively gain control over the decision making of a victim, basically making decisions as a proxy without authorization and against the a counter to the needs or the will of the victim. Often this is seen in financial exploitation. Things that you should that should make you worry that this is possible this is a possibility include social isolation, bereavement, recent loss of a spouse is probably the worst thing that can happen to an older person outside of a hip fracture or physical trauma. Because what ends up happening is usually two older persons together make one normal person, one functional person. They compensate, they often will compensate for the other's um, disability. Because as people get older and have certain diseases, they may lose certain things. For example, the husband with bad diabetes who now can't walk very well because of the nerve damage in his legs or he's got an amputation. So his wife does that, yet he is still managing the finances because that doesn't require him to walk. So they end up tag teaming to, fo to face life together as one unit. And that's what marriage essentially is. But this is when marriage becomes an adaptive to changes in functional status. When you take away one of those spouses, you're taking away that adaptation for functional loss. And then they become dependent. When they're dependent on someone, they're vulnerable. When they're vulnerable for someone, they're subject to undue influence. It's, the cycle goes back again. Other things I look for that potentially mean this. Dependence on another to provide care, financially responsible for an adult child or spouse. A high risk factor is having a child or another relative living in your house who is financially dependent on the older person. Talk about this at Grady, the check issue. They don't want mom going to a nursing home because then they'll lose a social security check. Well, if mom can't be taken care of in her home and you're not willing to take care of her correctly, you shouldn't be getting that social security check. That's for her benefit, not for your benefit. And let me tell you, children's, the, the, the ability of families to develop this mental gymnastics in order to justify why they deserve to have that check are often one of the biggest, um, uh, well, I think it's a predisposition for people exploiting their parents. They, they actually convince themselves, it's all right for me to do this. But the pathology underlying that, there's definitely some mental illness going on if you actually can twist your mind to really thinking that way. But you can see how easy it is to make that simple leap. I'll just, to, to wrap this up, I want to talk to you about what we're actually doing about it from a scientific perspective. And we're, I'm proud of Emory and our team, which we call the, which is TAME, or Task Force Against the Mistreatment of Elders. These are the people involved. Some of you may recognize some of these names, like Pat King. Um, and um, what we do is we're basically doing something that hasn't been done in elder abuse before, where we're actually looking at court records and the evidence of prosecution for, uh, that is in, um, in the name of victims of mistreatment. All the data before here, before this, is essentially limited to people who can respond to survey and therefore people who are not demented. What we're looking at is violent crime that occurs to older persons to find out what the risk factors of violent crime occurring to them are. So basically taking a criminology perspective, which hasn't been used in the medical field. So we're adding, we're combining the understanding of a medical disease with the understanding of criminology. Phase one um, was completed in 2000, uh, was completed last year, and phase two is in process right now. We basically, with uh, Jeannie Canavan's help, we collected files from both the Solicitor General's office and the District Attorney's office, misdemeanors and felonies. And we basically wanted to see who were the perpetrators, what was their relationship to the victim, what kind of victims, what were the features of the victims, what do they look like? Come up with a definition of who are the abused, especially for DeKalb County. The other 
groundbreaking thing of this study is the fact that all research up to this point has been either in Northern Europe, the Northeastern United States, or the West Coast. There have not been any studies like this in the Southeastern United States. And one thing I found from working on a national level is that the Southeast is quite different phenomenon than what you're seeing in the Northeast. You're more likely to see social and financial exploitation in the Northeast and more likely to see violent crime in the Southeast. People who study criminology know that, well, duh, that's what we've known, but medical has not, the medical field has not known this. The scientists that are studying elder abuse have not seen this and we're trying to bring this information to them. So what, this is what we found from the just, this is just the Solicitor General's office data. We're gonna compound into it the um, district attorney's felony data and eventually we'll be able to create a full data set for about 100 cases, which is the largest study of its kind even though it's only 100. What you see here is that the perpetrator is, for the, these are almost all physical abuse cases at the misdemeanor level. They're just essentially 40 cases that weren't escalated to the felony domestic uh, violence status. They were left at a misdemeanor battery level. Simple. Uh, perpetrators are most likely going to be men, three to one. The victims are roughly equal between the genders. So there can be either men or women. The mean age difference between the perpetrator and the victim is about a quarter of a century. So you see that there's a generational gap. That goes, this is just the race breakdown. See the victims, this, the significance of this I don't think is, um, is more reflective of just the t crime in general in DeKalb County and not necessarily, we're going to, when we apply st statistics to this, I seriously doubt we're going to see much difference in the context of crime. But the relationship is what I want to bring your attention to. Overwhelmingly, the most common perpetrators of these crimes at this level are children or grandchildren. Almost two and a half times more likely to be a child or grandchild than a spouse, which is different than most domestic, general domestic violence. Usually it's a living partner or a spouse. In this case, we see it's now intergenerational. One case of sibling, <laughs> that was a weird case. And then some others that we don't have a good understanding of who, what the relationship was between them. These do not, are not single events. Overwhelmingly, three quarters of these cases had previous cases also filed, previous calls, previous cars went out. These are repeat crimes, just like any other domestic violence crime. It's been part of the, the basically saying, well, we've got elder, we've got elder physical abuse here, it should make sense because this is congruent with domestic violence, that almost always you're gonna see that this is a repeat. So again, the step, defining elder abuse and fully seeding it within domestic violence. Additional risk factors identified. So for all the great efforts that the scientific community has put into it, there really is not that great of a correlation between the risk factors identified in the scientific literature and the risk factors actually identified in the victims. Case resolution, ha roughly half of them have some type of a plea entered. And they basically either, it's usually time served, the average fine is $20, that's because Georgia has very lax, fi uh, lax um, what is it called? Uh, the legislation is not exactly very good for levying large fines against these people. However, what you see here is the disturbing trend of what we just talked about in the last lecture, the nole, nole prosequi. The, pay, the, the victim refusing to testify. And since testimony in domestic violence is the majority of your evidence, unless you have photographs or videotape or something or a, wit, a third party witness, most of these cases will have to be dropped because of the fact that if the victim refuses to testify, you have nothing. And the SG can't pursue. And so then we have over a, th oh, a third of cases dropped. The most common reasons for nolle prosequi is the victim decides they want to drop the charges. This is unique because in most other states you cannot drop charges in domestic violence. Domestic violence in other states is considered a crime against the state. And yet we see this happening in Georgia and that may be one of the most fundamental changes we can make to Georgia legislation is basically saying 
any, any episode of domestic violence is considered a crime against the people of Georgia and not necessarily the individual person. Like New Jersey, for example, has that on the books. So if a domestic violence occurs, the, the victim cannot drop charges. It's, they're not able to. Only the state can. Insufficient evidence in 60%. This means failure, that they refuse to testify. They can't press, they don't want, they can't, they're not dropping the charges, they're just saying, we're not, I'm not gonna say anything bad against my child. And then 7%, the victim died before the time, before the decision could be made. And of course, that means you have no testimony unless you were able to videotape it. So the perpetrator is more likely to be male. There is a, ten, a trend towards more likely to be African American, although I think that when we finish the data, we're gonna find that that's not significant compared to other crimes in Georgia. More likely to be a child or grandchild will be significant. Um, the victims, we see men and women, both likely to be victims. The average age is 71 for cases that go to court. And the victims are more likely to be African American. Again, I think that that's gonna correct out. So, traditional risk, the important thing here is they're more likely to have been prior episodes of violence. That means that if we don't act when we see it, it will happen again. So we look at this from a medical standpoint. If I don't treat the blood pressure now, I'm gonna be forced to treat it later when they have a stroke. But then I'm gonna have a stroke to deal with in addition to the high blood pressure. So I might as well treat it now. The focus is on prevention. Elder abuse is notoriously resistant to prevention. Education, all these outreaches, they've tried them in the Northeast, they've tried them in California, they really are not that effective at reducing rates because rates cannot be measured accurately. So prevention uh, interventions cannot be validated or, ve or measured for effectiveness. What can be is efforts to prosecute, increasing number of court cases, increasing likelihood of having a judgment rendered, increasing likelihood of having jail time served. Those are things we can track. Those are concrete objective data. And that's gonna be the future of research for this. I think there's, this is one of those fields where you're gonna see this unique union of, of medical and social science with law enforcement because of the fact that together they have the full picture. But by themselves, each one is kind of fumbling around in the dark. So that's been my role is basically bringing all of you all together. I ended up putting a lot of miles on my Delta card last year. Um, so major risk factors for older persons suffering abuse include cognitive impairment, social isolation, and dependence on others. That's your take home. Cognitive impairment is often undiagnosed for years after it starts because of the fact is some people just dismiss it as getting older, senility, et cetera, when in fact it can actually be a pathology. So what you want to look for, again, in your reports or in your assessments at the home is you're looking for evidence of functional impairment of the victim. You know, even if they just can't get out of bed, ask them, can you stand up? And if they can't do it, functional dependence. Physical, de physical dependence on others for transfers. You have one of your ADLs lost. You're done. You've proven that they have impairment. No need to go further. Say physically impaired cannot walk. Guess what? That's great news to the district attorney's office because now they have a heightened scale to be able to say to the judge, this was a vulnerable person who was defenseless and unable to escape the acts perpetrated against them because they couldn't move. And that automatically will raise the ire of most judges, I believe. Most, common, most commonly, perpetrators will be related to the individual. We saw in elder mistreatment, it seems to be the children. A lot of focus in the last 20 years has been on what makes a child likely to become a, 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 a perpetrator of abuse. And, um, the Cornell group actually had some good stuff back in the 90s where they actually determined that the majority of perpetrators of violent crimes and domestic violence that are children and the victim is their parent usually have had some previous history of mental illness, whether it's hospitalization for depression, substance abuse, um, antisocial disorder, psycho a psychopathy such as multiple prison terms or having a jail term. And we, we're actually, in the broader scope in ours, we're actually looking at prior criminal history. And we're gonna to try to create those relationships. What makes a perpetrator a perpetrator? What do they look like? And all that you have to do to make the cases fit them to that profile. And if they fit that profile, then you've, started, you've already started making a strong case. So 
we got enough time to ask some questions, and we have an intimate enough group that we'd be glad to hear. Jeannie? Yeah. Yeah. Now, first thing is look at your environment, make sure there isn't a clock that they can see. Always, at the VA, it was catching me. When I worked at the VA, there was always a clock in the room. So I'm actually trying to get clocks removed from the room, but then, of course, patient, the patient um, advocates say, well, then they can't tell how long they're waiting in the room, so, all right. Just draw a circle. Say, this represents the face of a clock. Draw the circle for them. Some people say, don't draw the circle. But the scoring, a four-point scoring, you can draw the circle for them. In fact, the VA St. Louis University mental status exam has the circle already drawn on its form. So the circle you draw for them. They just need to put the numbers right. When, when they're doing it, watch them. This is my most sensitive indicator if I think something is structurally wrong with the brain. A normal person with fully intact executive function will draw four numbers first. You know what they are? What would they be? 12, 3, 6, and 9. I see those, that's the first thing they do. I know the rest of the test is going to be fine. If they don't do that and they start going 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, I know that there's going to be a problem. That's early, that's going to be early Alzheimer's disease. And it simply is that. Now, what do, I don't make a diagnosis just from that. I'm telling you that that is like, a, that's like definite suspicion, red flag immediately. And most likely, unless that person can prove their cognition is intact in other ways, they're going to end up with a referral for neuropsych testing. So at your point, you just have to show, is there a suspicion of impairment? If you see that clock drawer doesn't look right, I mean, it doesn't have to look aesthetically pleasing. The numbers are in the right place and the hands are in the right place, and it's drawn like, a, like an oval or even a square. I'm fine with that. Some patients are wise, like Weisenheimers. They will do a digital clock, and they'll say, 10 minutes have a chance to do 10, 10. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's why I tell them, draw all 12 numbers and the hands. But the VA patients are the ones that usually do that kind of stuff. Um, you'll find also obsessive compulsive people will probably try to like, make other details in there. But most people, usually, you look at the number placement. I use simple one-syllable words, ball, tree, flag. Those are the ones I usually use. Other ones are um, apple, penny, table. Um, another set is five, but that's for the VA test, and that's um, uh, tie, pen, car, house, and something else, flag. flag. See, it's a, I can remember that, but I do it five or six times a week. Um, I would just do the three words, simple words, nouns, not proper nouns, but, but standard nouns should be fine. Don't use colors. That's actually actually part of a cognitive brain. Don't say blue is one of your words, because that's actually a different part of the brain. You don't want to test it. Yes? Well, the date is basically asking for recollection of an, of an, individual, of an individual data point. The clock drawer is actually a test of organizational thinking. So the clock drawer test itself actually tests the frontal lobe. Date is checking a little tiny point. So it's like kind of like when you want to sample something, you don't want to take a little tiny medicine dropper, pull one drop of water out of the whole bucket, and say, this is my water sample. You want to take as much as you can or as wide an area, skim the top or skim the top and the middle, make sure you get it. So what I look at is when you do the clock drawer, you're testing multiple areas. You're testing one is organizational thinking, ability for planning, and a third is called praxis, basically figuring out how the hands relate to the rest of the object. And those are three areas versus asking someone who the President of the United States is, is just simply testing one area, which is memory recall. And um, you know, obviously, uh, there was a slide I showed that the woman says, I, prefer, I, I know it's not 1969, but I prefer to think of it as 1969. So some pathologies you may miss with just that simple. Now, to be fair, those are parts of different types of memory tests, but they're not done in isolation. Um, so, for example, the um, VA slums test starts off with what's the date, what's the day of the week, what's the month, what's the year. The mini mental status exam, the full student exam, the first five questions are basically orientation to 
um, a day, date, month, year, and season. So that's just asking for temporal, uh, or a temporal um, orientation. But again, that's only one part of cognition. If you have to do something, um, if you can only do one thing, you want to have it cover more areas. But those are questions that some people will use, yes. Any other questions? That's it, I've answered. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. We, yeah, because we're only catching what, go, what is actually going in the court for process, but we aren't looking at repeat cases in the same household. We haven't gotten to that point yet in data capture. So we just looked at one year in time. That's a theor one of the theories we've been thinking about is, is there a progression? Does financial exploitation eventually start leading to phys physical uh, abuse? And I think in other literature that's been shown, at least with regular domestic violence, that's been shown that there is a tendency for escalation. Um, but in elder abuse, we're not sure. And I think part of the reason why we may not be seeing it is because the lifespan of the victim is already reduced. So there isn't the duration that you could see with the domestic violence. With a spousal um, uh, abuse, you basically see a decade or longer of, inf of, of progress. But in elder abuse, if these patients have dementia, they have a lifespan of five to seven years after the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So you have this compression of time. So it's, it's going to be interesting. I'd love to be able to figure out how to do that data collection. If you have some ideas, I'll give you my card and you can send them to me. But we're just starting to actually end, bring in this type of data into the research. Because before, it almost all was survey, which is very weak. From a, from a scientific rigor perspective. It's very subjective.